Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. George Washington is widely considered the father of the United States. However, during the American Revolution, many of the real heroes were spies that we will never know their identities. Possibly the most famous was Agent 355, a woman directly feeding information to General Washington to help him turn the tide of the war. This episode tells of a similar story in the history of the NFL. This guy was immensely responsible for the success of the league, but you probably never heard of him. This is why he is often referred to as the NFL's Unknown Hero. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is September 21st, 1884, and we're at Highland Park, Illinois, because this is where the hero of our story was born. You know, that unknown hero that I talked about. His name was Hugh Ray also known as Shorty, because his stature was a little bit of a wee guy. He did not quite match the giant status of the NFL. And most have never heard of this cat. However, you and I have all been, as well as everybody out there as regarding the NFL is, we've been affected by this dude. He's had nicknames and that throughout the past it was NFL's unknown hero, also NFL's Mr. Einstein. But let's try to figure out why in this episode. You see, from 1938 to 1952, he was the official NFL supervisor to the officials and also the technical advisor. But let's get back to college, because we got to figure out, well, how did he get to this point? There's an old-timey kind of document in Google Books that, you know, it comes from the University of the Michigan Library, where it was titled Semi-Centennial Alumni Record of the University of Illinois, which is where he went to. In there, it described how he graduated with his degree in mechanical engineering. Also, the document stated that he, I'm using quotes here, prepared in Crane Manual Training High School and attended Lewis Institute before the University of Illinois. While he was in high school as well as college, he was a multi-sport athlete. You know, I talked about his tiny status and how small this guy was. The Pro Football Hall of Fame's website listed him at 5 foot 6 inches and 136 pounds which back then wasn't quite as, uh, you know, small as it is considered today, but, you know, 136 pounds, that's, that's not too you know, hefty. Uh, there's been many short heroes throughout the history, and, well, the guy I'm going to give you here, he's not quite uh, technically real. He's real in the minds of many fans across the universe, but uh, remember Marvel, you know, Wolverine? In the comics, this guy was only five foot three inches. But that dude, man, he's a straight-up B.A. mofo, and he was one tough sun gun, and he would be the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous, that is, individuals in the Marvel Universe. So maybe Shorty wasn't physically the most dangerous man in the NFL, but his mind was one of the most dangerous of all time as far as the NFL is concerned, and he would put on notice the rest of the leagues and sports in the entire universe, or at least America, saying, we're coming for you. We're going to be the top because we've got this guy in our corner. But speaking of this guy we have in our corner is the NFL. Well, how did he get into it? You know the rules. Why did he care? He was a multi-sport athlete in high school and college, but how did he really, you know, go from being just a player to someone that was a student of the game? There was a quote from back in 1946 where Ray told the Chicago Suns Time reporter that he was interested in the rules from his early playing days at the turn of the century because his athletic director and baseball coach 
George Huff, made sure that his players were well-versed in the rules, and it kind of just transferred over into the rest of his career, especially being a mechanical engineer. Everything was just a perfect combination where we will now begin the journey of the man known as NFL's Mr. Einstein. So after college, he taught mechanical drawing in high school for more than 30 years. He coached football and baseball. He was also an official for football, baseball, and basketball. In the biography, which is titled Hugh L. Ray, the NFL's Mr. Einstein, Master Designer of the Modern Game, it kind of described a lot of various, you know, intricacies of how his life was transformed into, you know, this tiny little guy into the giant of the NFL, basically creating the modern game that we know it as today. And I included a link to this book on Amazon in the show notes if you're interested in picking it up for yourself. Which, by the way, you can get to the show notes of your podcast player or by heading to the footballhistorydude.com. Also, I ask that you subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the freshest, hottest out the press episodes each and every week. But let's get back to Shorty Ray. I mean, this dude, he worked tirelessly to improve the rules of the game. We mentioned in probably four or five different episodes how Teddy Roosevelt played a major role at the beginning of the century for saving football because of the crazy amount of injuries and deaths even that were on the field. But some claim that it was Shorty Ray that saved football, not Teddy Roosevelt. Maybe Roosevelt, you know, he had that power and he put it to the beginning of the stages and set the foundation for us to be able to get to the point where Shorty could take over and create the rules. But many say that it was Shorty that really took us to the next level. That biography that I talked about, it stated that Ray first made contributions to the NCAA with some rule changes. And it was a smashing success. So the 1929 year, High School Federation, they would hire him to write a new set of rules for the game. Something that I found regarding this and the reason why was it was said that the high school federation was having trouble obtaining group injury insurance because of high fracture rates playing under the NCAA rules. And I saw in some places where Ray started working with the NFL in 1933, but the Hall of Fame website describes how he was actually hired in 1938. So I'm thinking probably for those five years, sure, he was working with the NFL, but not directly hired by them. But then in 1938, he was officially appointed the NFL's first technical advisor of the rules. And also he was the supervisor to the officials. He was known to demand professionalism and perfection and technique. And he had knowledge that surpassed anybody else regarding the rules out there. And he would expect his officials to have the same thing. Shorty Ray would also visit every team's training camp to teach the coaches and players about this new streamlined rule book and the new points of emphasis because he wanted to make sure that not only did his officials understand the rules, but the teams, the coaches, the players, everyone involved understood where we're going to go with an overall goal to make the game of football safer, faster, and better. Now, I covered this quote in last week's episode, but I kind of wanted to go ahead and interjected again because it kind of shows you how Shorty steered his ship and he kept everybody in line. The quote comes from Mark Duncan, the NFL supervisor of officials from 1964 to 1968, and it goes as such. He pounded the rules into his officials so that they could average 95% of a test at a coaching clinic on even the most difficult problems. Before that, they couldn't even reach that score, even with the book open at their elbows. So what he's basically saying is, man, They'd have an open book test. They still couldn't get it. What Shorty Ray got them to the point of the level of that Mount Everest top and you're just the top dog as far as understanding the rules of the game. So then we can enforce them because if we can't enforce them and we don't understand them, then how the heck are we going to make sure the players do the right thing? But his impact went well beyond officiating because this is where I think he had more of a overall technical impact on the enhancement of the game and making it the number one sport in America. You see, something that many do not correlate, science with football. I mean, nowadays we do with nutrition, science, and exercise, and all that other kind of thing. But he was the first, really, basically, to take the scientific approach to the game to improve safety of the game, make it faster pace, and also to increase the scoring. And with this, you know, he had concrete evidence of why there should be rule changes. And many rule changes came from Shorty 
But uh, well, let's just first run down a list, a few of the different rule changes that he had from his biography. And the first one came in 1927. He suggested the 32nd rule for the NCAA through Amos Alonzo Stagg to help improve the game tempo. In 1933, he invented the hash mark, spotting the ball 10 yards in from the sidelines in an effort to, you know, get the game moving towards the goal line instead of going side to side. He wants them to go goal line to goal line, you know, we got to push forward to try to score the ball instead of just doing whatever you gotta do there. And then in 1933, 1934, he wrote a rule that allowed passing anywhere behind the line of scrimmage. He authored more than 20 other rules to help improve the passing game too because he knew there was a correlation. He was a man for the fans. In 1934, he reduced the width of the football by one inch for college and pros so they could have a more aerodynamic design, you know, fling that ball out there soon, let's get that wind up there and take it on to the promised land. He also reduced it by one and a half inches for the high school because they got some smaller hands, you know, they're not quite growing up all the way. Also in 1934, he moved the hash marks to 15 yards inside, you know, from the sidelines for the high school, which then the NFL followed in 1935, and NCAA would henceforth then follow in 1938. Also in 1935, he made use of head protectors, like he made it mandatory for high school games. I call them head protectors. They say helmets, whatever. They're kind of like helmets, but ugh, not like the helmets that we think about nowadays. NCAA would follow this rule in 1939, and then the NFL would follow this rule in 1943. And I was thinking, I mean, that's a long time for them to figure this out. We're talking about the beginning of football, you know, before 1900s, and it took us all the way to 1943 before we're like, well, hey, we're mashing our heads up against each other, and, you know, we're going to get some headaches and some kind of worst things as far as concussions go. That just didn't seem too wise, you know? But as we shift forward, to, besides that, to 1941, apparently he was uh, responsible for free substitutions, at least at the high school level. We talked about it previously, NFL starting in 1943, you know, due to the war, but then they brought it back officially in 1949. However, Mr. Shorty Ray, now he had that forethought, Get the players out there, get them well-rested, have them be specialized, and then you're going to have a lot better chance to have an interesting, entertaining game for the fans. Then in 1948, he decided he's going to equip each official with a whistle. Each had the authority to stop a play, save time, and reduce injuries. Introduce also the penalty flag for them for the infractions of the rules. This really is, to me, a huge stepping point in the modernization of the NFL official because now we've got them with the authority to be able to, at any level, create more of a consistency within the game. And that biography uh, stated that between 1933 and 1952, his rules would add 25% more plays to the NFL and took average score of the NFL game from two touchdowns to six. And that's a pretty big increase, and we all know. Fans like scoring, offense pays the bills, offense puts those fans in the seats. And again, he did not take these decisions lightly. He was a man of science, where he used the scientific method. And speaking of the scientific method, here's the definition from Merriam-Webster, and it goes as such. Principles and procedures for the systematic pursuit of knowledge involving the recognition and formulation of a problem the collection of data through observation and experiment, and the formulation and testing of hypotheses. So let's go ahead and just say it. For the NFL, regarding scientific method and Merriam-Webster Dictionary, let's insert the picture of Shorty Ray, and you figure out how he was different from those before him and how he saved the NFL. But why not take my word for it? Let's take that DeLorean, let's go ahead and watch him on the sideline of a just random particular NFL game. Let's paint the picture. Pick your favorite team. Doesn't matter. They're playing against some rival team. They're on the sidelines and everybody in the fans, they're just focusing on how well the teams are performing and who's scoring the touchdowns, who's got the big hits and all these other things, but not Shorty Ray. He's sitting there on the sideline. He has his stopwatch, his pencil, and a slide rule. For those of you that don't know what a slide rule is, it's a ruler that had like these moving parts to mechanically calculate multiplication, division, and all sorts of other things, even some trigonometric and logarithm calculations, and interesting side bit. The slide rule was invented back in 1632 by an Englishman named William Outred. It's a super old technology at the time, but that's how the NFL felt compared to nowadays. Just like the slide rules would turn into 
handheld calculators and snouts, and we got smartphones. The NFL went from basically run-only to passing integration, and now it's a pass-heavy league. Shorty and his slide rule, though, they laid the groundwork. Because he knew that with all of his calculations, that it would lead more scoring and offensive firepower to having revenue coming in for the NFL. In fact, the Hall of Fame claims that he made over 300,000 technical observations. That's a lot of technical observations. Legendary coach George Hallis, back in 1974, had a quote that described what he felt Shorty Ray and his scientific approach meant to the game, and it goes as such. Ray's scientific approach to the game prevented coaches from obtaining rule changes solely for their own benefit. He generally ensured that any rule changes would be solely for the benefit of the entire league and the interest of the fans. I mean, George Hallis and Shorty Ray, it was, uh, they were kind of like buddies. And Hallis was the one that convinced NFL to hire Shorty, and they were both from Chicago area, so it kind of made sense back in the day. We talked about this quote in the previous episode, too. But George Hallis was found saying this, Getting the league to hire Shorty Ray was my finest contribution to football. And like I said last episode, that's a pretty tall order. Because George Hallis, he means so much to football. I mean, George Hallis drive their professional football hall of fame and everything. Let's just say, if he's saying that's his finest contribution to football, I think we should perk our ears up. We should just listen a little bit. And speaking of that finest contribution to football, Shorty Ray put together a report using his scientific approach after he analyzed statistics from previous NFL seasons and all the observations he had. Again, his goal was to improve player safety, make faster-paced games happen. Also, he wanted the end result to have more scoring. So, even though this isn't a huge deal or doesn't seem like much, here's a small minor example of how he helped improve the pace of the game. He suggested that the referees would relay the out-of-bounds ball back to the referee instead of one official running it back to the line. I mean, today, it seems obvious. But they said that Ray looked for ways to improve the game from every angle, at no cost to the league if possible. Hallis said of the report, Shorty didn't even charge us for the pencils. And Hallis also said of Shorty's scientific approach this, Shorty Ray was the first to realize that attendance rose with an increase in the offense. And Shorty named it, football for the fans. So that brings us back to previously talking about in the episode, Shorty is responsible for the modern game. And he's also greatly responsible for the reason why football is the number one sport in America. And we had many outcomes and successes from Shorty's approach. Uh, One example was in 1938 when Shorty entered the league, the average amount of passing yards for a game was 105. Then in 1952, when he left, each team would average 160 yards. So that's a pretty good increase. But a statistic that I thought was even more impressive and meant even more to the game was average attendance more than tripled the 25,000 fans in 1946, up from 8,211 in 1934. So we're talking 12 years, tripling the amount of attendance? That is a pretty good return on investment if you ask me for this little shorty Ray guy. But it doesn't stop there, because the biography also stated that his rules reduced injuries in high school by 70% and tripled the scoring in the NFL, including increased plays by 25%, and ultimately, you know, throughout his whole career, would quadruple the NFL attendance, so not just triple it from 1946. But with that being said, I mean, that's some pretty big stuff, and Hugh Ray's legacy was cemented in NFL history in 1966 because he was inducted as the first and still only officiating figure to the Professional Football Hall of Fame. And I'm going to let a quote from a Chicago sports writer in 1946 named Harry Shear kind of sum it up for you. And it goes as such. Football men who knew, and who are brave enough to admit it, confess that Ray, in his 20-year fight for a streamlined scientific rulebook, has accomplished more for the gridiron sport than any other man. Now, this article that described him as being more responsible for any other man, it was headlined, Football's Mr. Einstein. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets of one of the most underrated figures in NFL history. Next episode, 
we're going to dissect the contribution of another officiating figure to see if we believe he should be the second one to be inducted to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.